Woo! All right, hooray. So we're going to continue now with the last of the antipsychotic meds and move on to some of the mood modulators. My hope is that you can just run all these together. I'm sorry that the way the computer is working, I can't do it all in one big file. Bottom line is we're going to talk about the first generation typical antipsychotics versus the second and third generation, which are labeled atypical. The time when they were developed seems to be the more uh, important issue, but again, the hope was that the first antipsychotics really did have these horrible anti-pyramidal, extra-pyramidal effects, and so we're trying to find some drugs that could handle the psychotic symptoms without creating these aversive, uh, basically cholinergic and mood, uh, and sorry, motor problems. <coughs> It's, you know, it's not perfect. We're doing the best we can. So the first generation tend to have these Parkinsonian symptoms. Like I said, you've got the tardive dyskinesia, basia, uh, tardive, you know, impaired, and then dys often means awry. Kinesthetics is movement. So we've got a, a Parkinsonian-like set of tremors and uh, difficulty holding still, the tapping of the fingers. Uh, moving the tongue around in the mouth all the time, that's that's rough interpersonally and socially, as you can imagine, and just isn't the most pleasant set of side effects. The, the second generations were literally developed in an effort to combat these, some to some effect, some to others, and it does look like the ones that are uh, showing fewer side effects if they do work for somebody, it's that they're often more targeted towards that dopaminergic system. I did want to emphasize it's not that they get dopamine to fire so much as they have dopamine staying out in the synapse more. Obviously, a drug that's going to just crank up the dopamine is more like cocaine and amphetamine that's going to have a high potential for abuse. So what is this evidence for the dopaminergic hypothesis? Well, Basically, every time we mess with the dopamine system, we have evidence that psychotic symptoms change. So, as we discussed when we did the major stimulants, cocaine and amphetamine, if you bang away on that dopamine system long enough, basically get all the dopamine you have in your whole brain to squirt out, you're going to start seeing some of these features that are a lot like the hallucinations and delusions common to these disorders. And if you go the other direction, if you end up with a drug that's clearly going to block dopamine function, you do see the improved relief from these, these psychotic symptoms. Um, part of this came from folks who did have Parkinson's disease. They respond often well to L-DOPA, which is literally, you know, dopamine, it's essentially. And, and if they do too much of it, they end up with some of these schizophrenia-type symptoms. They often uh, starts with some of the delusions and eventually does seem to be the perceptual aberrations, hearing voices, things like that, and, and away it goes. So at least consistent with that idea. I've got a picture of a neuron here, but you guys already know this work. Basically, what we're talking about is the action seems to be in the synapse. The space between the neurons is where a lot of these drugs have their impact, and it's really all about having dopamine remain in the neurotransmitter in the uh, synapse for not as long, right? We're not going to have so much dopamine hanging out there in an effort to decrease dopaminergic function and then these uh, hallucinations, delusions, etc. So here's a potential test item. I just say, which of these is the neurotransmitter most associated with schizophrenia? We've got GABA, GABO, dopamine or serotonin, and of course you would pick dopamine. I do want to underscore the fact that behavioral interventions are super helpful for folks who have the psychotic disorders. Uh, acceptance and commitment therapy has had a crew that really spearheads this, and it's really all about accepting your thoughts for the fact that they are just thoughts, that you can have deviant experiences, even the hallucinations and deviant beliefs, and still behave in ways that are consistent with your values. And what a lesson for us all, and certainly puts... Uh, 
act for depression in, into uh, into perspective. The CBT enhanced work, a lot of it is uh, medication and pl- compliance. So literally just walking through with folks in that motivational interviewing style of the pros and cons of making sure you stay on these meds and uh, essentially setting up your environment so that you're more likely to have the cues for taking your meds, literally, you know, taking them at regular intervals, having uh, a, a place where they're accessible really early in your day and make this a habit, and even setting up little design, uh, little reminders. So, you know, as you're heading out the door, you see this little yellow post-it that says meds with a big question mark. And as mundane as that may sound, this is the kind of stuff that makes a big difference because, yeah, you may miss them one day and it doesn't seem like a big deal, but a psychotic break is an extremely expensive and difficult experience. It takes a lot out of clients themselves and it takes a lot out of their social support networks. And then I know it sounds a little bold, but there are data that support this, but literally, can I manage hallucinations with behavioral interventions? Well, yeah. And it's kind of wild, but if you do a functional analysis, if you if you essentially say, what are the predicaments, what are the conditions where these are more likely to happen? And often, they're a lot like that halt stuff we saw with alcohol relapse. So if I'm hungry, if I'm angry, if I'm lonely, if I'm tired, those are all potential markers for increasing the idea that uh, my thoughts suddenly start sounding like voices. The fatigue is a big contributor. And just to get their sleep on a regular schedule has a huge, huge impact. And then the disputing, if you're you know, if you down with the notion that I can actually talk to my own cognitions and maybe take them a little less seriously or even dispute the ones that are more irrational. This is a big plus. And then normalizing the fact that voices are even there and challenging that stigma. It's got to be rough when you hear a voice inside your head and how could you not make either make that mean I'm completely crazy or you know some other delusional stuff. But truth be told, we all have, in a sense, a little voice inside our head. We all uh, have at least plenty of moments where we think in words and you can see how that might essentially get confused with the perspective that there's a voice going in your head. So again, if I can emphasize that this is something that's more normalized, maybe I won't pathologize myself and essentially the mood associated with the experience doesn't have to be so dramatically negative. So here's a quick item if you had to guess. What's the uncontrolled motor side effect of neuroleptics? Oh, I I gave it away because I said neuroleptics. What's the uh, uncontrolled motor side effect of antipsychotic drugs? Is it neuroleptic, tardive dyskinesia, or piloerection? Obviously, neuroleptic is actually another name for the meds. Tardive dyskinesia, this is it. As we mentioned, you'll know it from kinesthetic, that Greek root, and then dys is always messed up. Uh, Piloerection, you may remember from the opium... An opiate lecture, I know it sounds like having a small penis, but it's really the uh, hair on your arms is sticking up. The pilo, the little bitty hairs, are are sticking up, not to be confused with any of the uncontrolled motor side effects of the antipsychotic drugs. Well, great, I'd like to make the transition to the mood disorders, in particular spend uh, quite a bit of time on depression, and then uh, tip my hat also to bipolar disorder, the the manic episodes. And this is just a list of famous people who happen to suffer from depression. I feel like there's a a duty, if you will, to just kind of normalize this. Look, hey, everybody has bummer times and quite a few of us have had literally months on end of I can't get out of bed, uh, often complicated bereavement. And then, uh, you know, you lose something serious and then it just becomes this big unendurable depressive episode. Uh, unfortunately, without treatment, these often last 14 months, which just, ugh, that's, that's harsh. But Roman Emperor, Emperor Tiberius, uh, Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, Tchaikovsky, Dostoevsky, Abe Lincoln's depressive episodes are pretty legendary. And even Freud, it's uh, 
a little confounded when he had the cocaine use and the cocaine withdrawal, but it looks like Sigmund Freud also had uh, basically a diagnosis of depression as well. Oh, I have an intriguing photo here of Abe Lincoln. I can't imagine what it's like to get up every morning and shave your lip and leave the rest, but he really did have uh, a series of difficult long-term depressive episodes under, you know, arguably some of the most stressful conditions you can imagine. At the time, they used what they used to call the blue pill. This was a basically a mercury-laced medication, and I use that word in, in scare quotes. Uh, it was mercury and like rose water and honey and some fillers, and, you know, it was literally toxic. In the 1850s, too, uh, some evidence that Abe Lincoln really didn't get into a lot of trouble, was impulsive, was aggressive, and at least some folks offer some conjecture about maybe that was in response to those meds. But yeah, mercury poisoning is not good for anyone. Uh, if you break a thermometer and get mercury on your hands, just run to the doctor. Well, let's take a look at the hallmark symptoms of depression. Again, I know many of you already took abnormal psych. But the meaningful distinctions are that you have to have a whole cluster of these. It's not just uh, a sad mood for a couple of days. It's really much more of a disturbance that's long term. In addition to sad mood, uh, if clients don't report that, they might just report anhedonia. And what's anhedonia? It's the inability to experience tr pleasure. So. Uh, you know, the word heed, hedonists, our misunderstanding of what the hedonists stood for is that they always wanted pleasure all the time. And is sort of the opposite of anhedonia, literally the inability to experience pleasure. But these other uh, vegetative symptoms, symptoms that have to seem to do with feeling like a vegetable. So uh, disturbed appetite. So either I can't eat anything at all and it all sounds dreadful and I wouldn't want it in my mouth anyway, or oh my God, something on earth is the, is the food that's going to make me feel better and I just need the 11th scoop of ice cream and these six cinnamon buns and it's bound to help, right? So we see extremes in uh, weight, lace, weight loss or weight gain. The sleep disturbance, it's funny because it's both insomnia and hypersomnia. Hypersomnia meaning a whole lot of sleeping. Man, 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., there just ain't no going to sleep. But, ooh, once I drift off, man, 2 p.m. is just a wonderful time to keep flopping around in bed. Inappropriate guilt. So now we're moving towards more of the affective ones, but I'm not talking about just being Jewish or Catholic here, but literally you feel guilty for things that there is no way you could have possibly done. Uh, the rumination component of this is common, like, you know, working over, I said this, and then he said that, and he texted this, and I texted that. What does it mean? And starting to feel guilty, literally, about uh, a minor social interaction that the other person likely doesn't even remember. That's a hallmark symptom of depression. Uh, the concentration disturbed. It is super outrageous how much these symptoms suck up attentional capacity, and so then... What you have left over makes it tough to make simple decisions, get work done, even, you know, plan your day. So the thought of picking something off the menu just sounds overwhelming because right now I've got such other vegetative things to consider. Again, a sign that uh, the experience of a mood disorder thoughts of death. And it's, it's curious. It doesn't have to be suicidal ideation. Well, that's certainly qualifies, but a lot of this, and I don't just mean teen eggs, but like obsession with what is it like to be dead, uh, reading about people who died in strange ways, watching a lot of documentaries about death. Oh, uh, hey, I can't point any fingers. And finally, the most of the vegetative symptom of all, the, the fatigue. So you can see just, I can't get out of bed. And it really kind of fits the model that looks like depression is actually a, an anti-inflammatory disorder in some sense that, that folks are so puffed up, if you will, that they can't even move. So these more physical, stereotypical uh, symptoms are the vegetative ones. So I can't move. I, my sleep is gone awry. I can't seem to eat. And then the cognitive ones is more the perseverating in my mind about death, can't seem to focus, and 
feeling guilty all the time. And those two factors seem to provide some novel information about uh, unique links to some of the covariates of depression. Oh, there's old Freud now. I, uh, well, what can you say? The poor guy had his ups and downs like any of us. Well, we got all caught up in that generation notion with the antipsychotics. And so what, one way to group the antidepressant men's is also by generation, literally which ones came first, which ones came next, and so on. The first generation drugs were the first that actually had any potential for efficacy after, you know, tons and tons of folklore. And unfortunately, at least uh, in the West, we didn't pay attention to some of the natural medicines that are actually really potentially productive for this, but we have MAO inhibitors and the tricyclic drugs. So MAO inhibitor literally means monoamine oxidase. It ends in A-S-E. So you know it's an enzyme. Basically, this is an enzyme that breaks down the monoamines, norepinephrine or serotonin or dopamine. And if it's going to be an inhibitor, it's going to inhibit the enzyme that breaks those down in hopes of leaving them out in the synapse for longer. Uh, side effects for these are aversive, as we'll discuss, so they uh, didn't last long, although uh, some set of folks end up getting them prescribed simply because they have adverse reactions to the other ones. And the tricyclics, uh, I know it sounds like, oh, it would be fun to ride a tricycle right now, but it's really that they have three carbon rings in the molecule, and it's unclear exactly what that has to do with getting the things to work, but we do see some of the same changes in the serotonin function in particular in response to these meds. Uh, again, some odd side effects and then not incredible, impressive efficacy. So folks kept searching and uh, came up with what we're calling the second generation drugs, the SSRI. So selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and another crude called the SNRI, so selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And a take-home message is just know you what, know what reuptake is, that presynaptic neuron is squirting out the neurotransmitter, and normally it would want to conserve, you, know, you don't want to make more neurotransmitter if you don't have to, so it would draw that back into the presynaptic neuron and save it for later when the message has to be sent again, this essentially inhibits that reuptake, so leaves that neurotransmitter out there a little longer. The third generation drugs, uh, we can split hairs here, but uh, basically the Remeron, the Serazone effects, are, these also seem to work uh, loosely in some of those same neurotransmitter systems, and if they had been invented uh, about the same time as the SSRIs, I would not be surprised if we didn't even give them these names. Uh, the serazone effects are, I mean, we've talked about this before, the, the marketers for psychiatric meds seem to love Z's and X's, so I wouldn't be surprised if Zizek ends up on the, on the market relatively soon. Well, let's get into a little detail on each of these. So the MAOIs, uh, again, you don't have to know the name of any specific one, but just understand that their key issue is that they do have those three carbon rings, and unfortunately, they create a side effect related to tyramine. The, neuro, the neurotransmitter, the, the amino acid, seems to be hard to metabolize in the presence of this, so we get what's called the wine and cheese effect. Uh, that's kind of a lofty name for it, really. It's just anything that's fermented that has tyramine in it is going to give you an aversive reaction if you're on MAOIs. Um, Serotonin syndrome, basically suddenly the, your serotonin is out of whack and has potential to go up uh, to a very high level. If you are contemplating using ayahuasca for an antidepressant or for, you know, just to build your soul, uh, you definitely do not want to have these in your system. The truth being that uh, there's already an MAOI in the, the tea, so again, uh, hallucinogens are not a toy. And here's just a nice little... Uh, concept map to show, okay, well, here's essentially a set of these drugs that fit the tricyclic category. They definitely alter reuptake of serotonin, dopamine, and or uh, epinephrine. The correlates, though, are they have these uh, rough side effects basically associated with sedation, nausea, dry mouth, constipation, right? So we've got these kind of drying you out cholinergic type effects. This oddball urinary retention where you're trying to pee and you just can't, 
And then there's some photosensitivity. Uh, we see that with, say, John's ward as well. It's kind of a strange uh, thing to describe. It's not that you go out in the sun and you, you know, get blinded or anything, but your skin seems to change. And you do seem more sensitive just to the, to the baseline light. And then blurred vision. The optic impacts are very strange and not necessarily common, but uh, in a subset of folks, it really does seem to be severe. So there are some contraindications, meaning there's some folks who really should not be on the tricyclics. Anybody who's already on an MAOI, of course, anybody who's on any other sedatives, because it's already so sedating, if you happen to have uh, an MI, if you'd had a heart attack recently, you don't really want to mess with this because it does seem to alter... Uh, basically the regularity of heartbeat. Uh, acute glaucoma, basically the narrow angle, uh, this strange pressure on the eye that's the source of the blurred vision also could get uh, become risky for glaucoma. Uh, if you had a psychotic break, these aren't a great idea. The whole notion of putting folks with psychotic disorders on antidepressants is controversial and kind of weird anyway. And if you've had a history of seizures, it's it's kind of complicated, kind of depends on the subset of seizures, but it's just not a good medication for those folks. So as you can see, again, we've got these names, Elevil, Parmalar, Norpermin. You don't need to know these. It's that the uh, generic name's all in this ene or lean. So amitriptyline or triptyline, desipramine, right? That kind of sound seemed to be the way to name them. And then we had the SSRIs, which in the late 80s, early 90s, just seemed to be everyone's salvation. So probably the best known is Floxetine and Prozac, but I'm sure you guys have seen Lexapro and Zoloft, Paxil, and Celexa, and some of you may even be on it. And the take-home message again is it uh, ends up putting serotonin into the neurotransmitter for a longer duration. Initial results were super positive, but as we started publishing more data and really taking a close look, the placebo effects were probably 80% as large as these, and particularly if you had a, an active placebo, something that created a side effect of its own, people started thinking, hey, this is going to work. I got to tell, tell you, too, that the withdrawal to getting off it is harder than uh, we, we were taught in the 90s, shall we say. So... 46% uh, or basically, you know, almost half of the folks say that they've had some pretty serious withdrawal going on and that it lasts for weeks. It's not like just a couple of days that you really have this weird agitated kind of hyper aroused teeth grinding component. And then some folks have that reaction to the meds themselves. I've been on them. They take, oh, they're super nauseating and just dreadful. Ugh, not, not good meds. And I'll leave the link to... A review that Irv Kirsch, the guy who's done all the placebo work, says he really does not see why we keep using these other than to keep the drug companies in money. With that in mind, I just wanted to touch base on the bipolar disorder. So, uh, again, this used to be called manic depression, and the hallmark is that you've had uh, a serious manic episode. So I'm not talking about you jumped up or up and down because you your team won the football game or something like that. They were talking about like three days of literally having trouble sleeping, the pressured speech, the inability to just calm down sometimes, and then a lot of correlates of that kind of arousal. So ill-advised sexual encounters, ridiculous spending. Oh, I mean, I can tell you stories, but the bottom line, and like my friend Ed decided he was going to shoot the president uh, called people and went to a bar to announce it. Um, oh, I had a client who decided to do the nine-day bike race across America during a manic episode. Uh, oh, the guy my wife used to date decided he was going to invite everybody to dinner at his house and just put flyers up all over campus to say, hey, come to my house for dinner. So you can imagine uh, there's a grandiosity this sort of uh, contributing and a whole lot of energy, but then that depressive wave kicks in and then you've got all the symptoms that we already discussed. The only one of these you really need to rec recognize is lithium. It's still among the most common, if not the most common prescription. And the danger is that it is toxic. So you really do have to have your blood levels assessed if you're going to be on lithium to control the manic episodes. 
I had a client, man, I really miss her. She was wonderful, kept it all controlled, was really on top of it. But as you might guess too, the comorbid substance abuse is big, right? If you're up all night anyway, why not party away? Or if you're having trouble sleeping, who wouldn't think, hey, how about six more beers, right? So that seems to be the other uh, key issue. As you age to your lithium toxicity, basically the... Uh, your lean body mass changes, so how much lithium you need to have the effect versus how much is toxic is really a delicate balance. And uh, sadly, the, the reactions, at least in the geriatric clients I've had, is makes it look like they're having a manic episode. So got to keep an eye on that blood level of lithium. Uh, Valproate was actually... Uh, a seizure med and we just kind of find out by accident Risperidol we saw is in with the antipsychotics um, truth be told we have no idea how these work or what the hell's going on oh here's a cute list of famous folks who happen to have bipolar disorder I do want to give a shout out to Maria Bam for the stand-up comic I just love her and man she really has had the highs that are high and the lows that are low and you wouldn't be stunned to learn that makes for some great material when you're on stage. Russell Brand, of course. Uh, Demi Lovato has been really candid. Carrie Fisher, I think, basically wrote a novel in a hypomanic episode. And it's easy to idealize this, but what you don't uh, often see is there's all this frustration when people get in the way, right? So my client who wants to do the nine-day bike race across the United States, and I say, hey, remember that contract we made? And he tears it up, and he's mad at me for interfering with his night date by creator. That it's, uh, it's wonderful to be, you know, euthymic and energetic until, you know, the police come because you're not supposed to uh, be in all the bathrooms in all the towns and all the cities in all the world. Uh, Hemingway, Hendrix, Churchill, some of this is more con conjecture. Hendrix definitely had a song called Manic Depression that's utterly delightful. Uh, it looks like he probably did have both sides of that, the uh, depressive episodes and the manic episodes. Hemingway certainly had the depressive times. Churchill used to say, my black dog. He would have these big depressive episodes too. Of course, he drank so much. Who knew if we could tease those things apart? <laughs> so I have a photo here of a antidepressant man, not anything that you guys need to worry about. So here's a, just a nice slide that sort of summarizes the hallmark symptoms on both sides. The key here, too, is that I just want to leave you with the idea that cognitive interventions and behavioral interventions can keep both depressive and manic episodes to a minimum. you got to pay attention to how you feel, and you got to make self-care a priority. All right? We're going to get into the behavioral stuff, including... Just a number of alternatives, the St. John's wart and the behavioral activation, cognitive behavior therapy, interpersonal therapy, and stuff like that in the very last section. But more than anything, I just want to stop it here. Make sure you know these symptoms. If you see them, if you happen to be taking an exam, understand that lithium is probably the most popular med for bipolar, but you really have to watch for blood levels. And that uh, the antidepressants barely beat placebo and have a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of negative side effects. Some of you know I've been doing that work with ketamine and, and trying to make some points about the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Pretty impressive data, at least in the short term, that a psychedelic experience appropriately supported can alleviate depressive symptoms in intriguing ways. It doesn't last a long time, but I'm thinking it's just long enough to get folks into therapy and get them to learn the model or start doing behavioral activation things. Uh, if you're interested in that at all, I probably have some research I'd like you to participate in, although I'm not administering any hallucinogens. Um, thanks so much for listening. I know it's a crazy time. You guys are the bomb.